So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our first part of um, our webinar series, Rebuilding Beef Herds and Assisted Reproduction. Um, my name is Megan Brown and I'm the Northern Australian Sales Manager for Minitube Australia. Um, Minitube Australia, for those of you who don't know, um, is actually a, a German company, family owned company that specialises in reproduction um, in all different species. So in livestock, um, domestic animals, and even things like um, fisheries. So that's who we are as a company. And um, today I've also got Dr. Rachel O'Higgins here with us and I'll let Rachel introduce herself. Yep, hi there. Um, I'm the technical services veterinarian for Minitube Australia. Um, so I just generally provide advice and technical support uh, on our products and how to use them as well as um, doing on-farm and in-clinic teaching sessions. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so today we are going over um, sort of some of the management topics around herd rebuilding. And to kick things off, um, we'll just go through some of the agenda. Firstly, we want to have a look at setting breeding objectives and how to do that. Um, choosing what sort of breeding system may suit your objectives. Then we'll have a look at the different types of assisted reproduction that are available that could fit in with that and then how to match those types of assisted reproduction with your particular breeding objectives. Um, next week we'll carry on and have a look at the preparation um, for the breeders before joining. Then we'll have a look at breeder and bull physiology, uh, setting expectations for your breeding uh, season, running assisted reproductive programs and measuring the success of those programs. There's a couple of things we'd like well, we hope you can take out of um, this session today. Firstly, how to get to know your herd a bit better and know what your goals are. Also how to choose and set your um, breeding systems up so they fit your business objectives. And finally, to have a look at how assisted reproduction um, can be used as a rebuilding management tool to complement some of those breeding objectives um, that you've set for yourself. So firstly, when we think about breeding objectives, this is just getting to know what your plan is and what your goals might be for um, your particular business strategy and pinning down what you're trying to achieve. Uh, some of this information has been um, adapted from the Queensland Department of Agriculture's uh, business information from some of their breeding edge workshops. And pretty much breeding objectives in a nutshell just provide a framework for your business to help you make um, management decisions and actions that will lead to a more sustainable business structure um, now and moving into the future. When you're setting breeding objectives, there's a couple of things to think about. So firstly, they must be recorded. So you need to have them written down somewhere. Um, this gives it some sort of tangibility as well. They need to be specific, so they can't be too broad that you can't measure them and that you can't look back at them and compare them to your results. They do need to be quite specific goals. They also need to be measurable and this just means that they've got some parameters in place that you can um, say yes we've achieved those or no we haven't and how are we going to get there in the future. They need to be attainable and sometimes you won't know if these goals are attainable until you attempt them, but um, preferably being attainable gives you more motivation to, to get them done and to be able to go back and set new ones and reevaluate as you go. And finally, they also need to be time sensitive. So this just gives them some urgency to maintain that, that motivation to keep on track with your breeding objectives. One big thing to consider is that you can't manage what you don't measure. So that's why it's really important to get some of this information written down so you can actually have a look at your business structure as it is and then come back at a later date and compare it to where um, you thought you wanted to go and see if you've achieved that. So some things to consider when, um, when rebuilding because there are a lot of places around Australia at the moment that are rebuilding for, um, for one reason or another and for that reason, we've wanted to, um, to run this webinar for a little while because currently there's going to be a lot of investment happening into 
genetic material. And that is a great opportunity to do that when you're rebuilding. However, that also means there's a lot of capital tied up in that. So we wanna make sure that um, people have some kind of framework to, to follow when implementing breeding decisions and utilizing those genetics. So you get the best out of um, your investment that you've made. So some things to consider are evaluating your current position. So what does my herd currently look like? How do I identify and keep the good cows? And do I have enough good cows for my business right now? Also think about how you're going to do this. So do I breed from within my current herd? Do I buy cattle in? Do I use this as an opportunity to change breeds or diversify my markets? Um, and can I select or how do I select stock and genetics that are going to be um, beneficial for my herd going forward? When setting up your breeding objectives, these form the building blocks of your business. So um, there's a couple of things to consider when doing this. Firstly, knowing your land is really important. Um, when you bring animals onto your property, two thirds of their potential that's expressed comes from the environment around them. Only one third of that is attributed to genetics. So knowing your land and its capabilities will allow you to get the best out of your herd and set those objectives. You need to know what you've got as well. So building a current herd profile to identify all the animals in your system, um, what ages they are, what breeds, um, what the breakdown is, just so you have a baseline to work from. Then you need to know your reproductive performance indicators. So what are you measuring the success of your breeders from? Um, have a look at how they're currently performing and what you might like them to be doing down the track. Knowing your market. So understanding what the specifications are that are required of you, um, what your timelines are, and also do you have backup markets in place? Because currently, um, as we all know, markets sometimes overnight can change. So it is good to know what your backup markets are and what your options are so you don't get stuck. Knowing your cash flow. So you can compile a cash flow analysis and this can be done um, extensively through an accountant or it can be um, a baseline model to begin with, just with costs and expenses, what your assets and opportunities may be. Understanding your current breeding system. So knowing the targets that you've got for yourself and how you're measuring that. Um, and that will give you some idea of where you want to go. Knowing your selection criteria for bringing in new animals or new genetics. Looking at things like EBVs, um, physical traits or certain production targets you might be aiming for. And once you've got all of these things um, taken into consideration, you can then build that picture of what your current herd is, where your business is and where it needs to go. Just before moving on, I did want to make a note on estimated breeding values. Um, these are an absolutely fantastic tool that you can use when you're uh, buying in new genetics. So a lot of breeds have these available now and they do form a puzzle though um, that is made up of physical inspection, the EBVs that, um, of that particular animal and also what your goals are. So they're not the main thing you need to consider but they are high on that list. Um, as I said, many breeds have them available and the accuracy is improving for a lot of the traits as well and new traits are being added too. So there's a link there to the breed plan website um, if you want to have a look at your particular breed and that website's just been updated to make it a little bit easier to follow. Um, when we have a look at choosing a breeding system, so when we are um, herd rebuilding, because this is only a short webinar, I've kind of condensed these um, objectives down into five broad areas um, to consider when, when rebuilding. So the first one is using it as an opportunity to improve your genetics. Um, it may be something you're considering is breeding for sex selection. So do you want to breed more heifers as replacement heifers? Do you want to breed more bulls? Um, maybe you're breeding on a contract for bulls. Do you just want to increase the amount of kilos of beef that you're turning off from where you're at currently? Um, are you wanting to put more calves on the ground quickly and just build your numbers up really quickly. And lastly, do you want to change your carving pattern? So maybe you're moving from year round into a seasonal carving pattern, or maybe you want to take this as an opportunity 
to shift that um, the seasonal carbon you already have uh, to a different time of year. So when we look at these objectives um, and how they can be achieved, and particularly in a, in a fairly rapid fashion because um, we're building from a smaller base at the moment, there's a couple of ways you can utilise um, assisted reproduction technologies in that. Um, I just wanted to go through a couple of different systems that are available and um, give an outline of what they are. So firstly, there's um, IVF or in vitro fertilisation. This is when the eggs are collected from donor cows, they're matured and fertilised within the lab, and then the embryos are transferred into synchronised recipients or they can be frozen. The second one is MOET, or you may know as flushing or embryo transfer. This is when donors are super ovulated to produce numerous oocytes or eggs. The donor is then artificially inseminated. Um, the fertilization and maturation occur within the cow. She's then flushed to retrieve those embryos and they can either be transferred into recipient cattle again or they can be frozen. Um, fixed time artificial insemination is another option. So these are, this is when cows are synchronized to come on heat within a small time frame, and all of the animals um, are blanket um, AI within that window, then bulls are usually added as a mop up. Um, and the final one is bull sync. So this is when cows are partially synchronized to increase um, or to initiate a tighter ovulation pattern. There's no AI involved and the heats are expressed over um, a week or so. Bulls are then added at a bit higher percentage than what you normally would. Um, all of these systems have their advantages and disadvantages depending on what you want to use them for. But today we're going to focus mainly on fixed time AI and bull sync because these are the main two that can assist with herd rebuilding strategies quite rapidly. Um, how, do, how do you know which goal fits in with which reproductive system? So if your goal for rebuilding is just wanting to improve your genetic gain, um, all of the systems we just spoke about can do that and they offer that in different ways. Um, however, rebuilding, when rebuilding, it's important to think about the fact that your base herd is often now limited and the choices of genetics that you have um, can be quite, quite low as well. So if you're going to be investing in something like this, um, it is important to think about investing as much as you can in good genetics because that will stay with you and stay with the herd for a long period of time. That one bull gets joined to multiple cattle and that can um, have a lasting impact for a long time. If you're wanting to breed for sex selection, so all um, the IVF flushing and fixed time AI can utilise sex semen to do this for you. However, something to think about is that it's more common in dairy herds. So dairy sex semen is a lot more readily available. Um, there's a bigger selection of sire choices and it's often also more economical than beef sex semen. Um, there is still beef sex semen available and it is a growing market. So it is something that you can, you can use if you want to. Um, and if you're taking this as an opportunity to just breed for more kilos of beef. Um, all the systems do offer gains in beef production for different reasons. However, this is where fixed time AI and bull sync really have their benefits. Firstly, all animals are bred at the beginning of the season. So you can also utilize genetics of higher value because you're using straws instead of buying one bull. Um, the sync programs can kickstart cycling in certain classes of animals that may um, have a later cyclicity um, start than, than they would uh, normally. If they're in low body condition, um, if they're cows that have got a calf at foot or if they're not cycling uh, for numerous reasons. So um, your synchronization programs can help with that. A tighter calving pattern is also achieved from these systems. So you have more uniform weaning weights and really even lines of calves. They also have a higher average weaning weight because you're really front loading that breeding season. And by doing that, you're reducing calving drift as well. So those cows are more profitable and they stay in the herd for longer periods because they've got more time to recover between calves. So this keeps, um, keeps them in the herd for longer. Um, I might hand over to Rachel now to cover this part. 
Okay, so how do we produce more beef? There's a study that was done um, to look at that a system uh, versus the pregnancy rate over 90 days of joining. So it was uh, designed to compare the reproductive performance of the natural service, um, artificial insemination using estrus detection and fixed time artificial insemination. So this experiment was done in Brazil on 597 suckled Vos indicus beef cattle. They were 55 to 70 days postpartum at the time. And you can see we've got these four groups. So I'll just explain which is which. The blue line at the top is cows synchronized for fixed time AI at the start of the breeding season. They were bred by fixed time artificial insemination 10 days after the onset of that breeding season and bulls were then placed with the cows 10 days after they were inseminated until the end of the 90 day breeding season. The green line is cows that were synced for fit time AI at the start of the season and again were bred by artificial insemination 10 days following the onset and then from day 10 up until day 45 of the season these cows were inseminated based on estrus detection and then bulls were placed with the cows for the last 45 days of the breeding season. So you can already see that the bulls were better at identifying which cows were in season than the humans were. The grey line is cows that were bred by artificial insemination based on oestrus detection only, so no fixed time AI, and that was for the first 45 days of the season, and then that was followed up by natural service to the bull for the last 45 days of the season. This is the least effective, and that's a reflection of the difficulty we have in oestrus detection, particularly uh, in these boss indicus breeds sometimes, they don't show as overt signs of oestrus um, as some other cattle types. And the orange line there is the cows bred by natural service for the whole of the 90 days. So the advantage of having them pregnant early and calving early the following year then means that the cows will be in optimal body condition. There'll be good feed on the ground at the time. Um, so they'll end up with bigger calves. There's better nutrition for them. Um, the cows will be producing better milk. The calves will then grow bigger. If you're breeding heifer replacements, they'll be better grown by the time you want to bring them into your system. So you've got more beef because your calves um, are going to be bigger. Those that are born later on in the season, there's less feed, a little bit less milk from the cows, and they're going to be smaller due to age and nutrition. Um, so in this study, the cows bred by fixed time AI had a calving to conception interval reduced by an average of 17 days compared to those um, that were either inseminated to estrus detection or bred to the bull. Um, pregnancy rates were increased by 30% within those first 45 days, and there was higher pregnancy rates at the end of the breeding season. So this was another experiment that was designed to compare breeding to the bull versus a bull sink versus fixed time AI uh, followed up by a bull. Um, so yeah, the top one there just shows that you just put the bull in at day zero, um, and then they were pregnancy detected and the next one down shows the sink. So I, Megan briefly mentioned that earlier. It basically just means you have a slightly tighter interval of your cows coming onto heat, but it's nowhere near as tight as a fixed time AI where you want them all to be ovulating at roughly the same time for insemination. And um, so it sort of tightens up the interval but it's maybe within a week or so. Um, so you do need a slightly higher um, number of bulls. But um, other than that, it's great because it brings into heat those cattle that may not already be cycling um, and sort of tightens up your window a lot more. And then that last group was the um, uh, synchronized to fixed time AI followed up with some bulls. And you can see there was regular pregnancy detection um, and then we calved those cows and we're looking at their weaning weights. 
So you can see the pregnancy rate in those first 24 days is over twice the number of cows pregnant to just the bull when we use the sink for a fixed time AI. And by the end of the season, the pregnancy rate is also higher um, when we've done a sink. So when we're looking at the weight of the calves, um, comparing the calves born in each group, you can see that um, there's quite an increase in weight from those that just uh, were in with the bull versus those that we did a sink in the bull um, and a bigger jump again to those that had a fixed time AI at the beginning of the season. And if we drill down a bit further into those figures and we look at the kilograms of calf achieved per cow, so now we're looking at all of those cows, including those that didn't get pregnant. Um, we have obviously a much bigger jump now between the ones that were just in with the bull versus the fixed time AI followed up by the bulls. So an extra 69 kilograms of calf achieved per cow between those two groups, which um, starts to look pretty significant. And you can see that the trend is echoed across breeds. So when we compare the Boss Indicus to the Boss Taurus, it's the same story in terms of um, getting a much heavier calf um, when we've done a fixed time AI. Um, about 8 to 10% of that is going to be due to genetic gain. So we can you know, use frozen semen of higher genetic merit. And um, about 11 to 14 percent of that gain is going to be due to the fact that they're calving earlier, so they're older. So, if your goal is more calves on the ground, um, you have the available feed, you want to produce more weaners or breed more replacement heifers. Um, all systems have benefits um, for multiplying your genetics fast, but fixed time AI with a resync is most common, um, and that would be where we do a normal synchronization, um, inseminate those animals, and then it's exactly how it sounds. You replace that progesterone device, and um, then you scan and pull out those that are pregnant and do another insemination to fix time with those that are empty. And um, the decision will come down to breeding objectives for the herd and your available capital. So how do we get more calves from an assisted reproduction program? Um, we need to remember the most profitable pregnancy is the earliest pregnancy. Um, so ideally, we want to aim for one calf per cow per year. Uh, so we actually don't have a lot of time to achieve that. Um, we have a really short interval in which the cow has to fall pregnant again so we can achieve one calf per cow per year. Um, under the absolute best conditions, we're maybe looking at 55 days, which is only two and a half cycles. Um, we have this sort of period at the beginning up to day 30, but realistically 40 or 50, where the cow just cannot get pregnant again. We need that time for uterine involution um, and for her to resume normal cyclicity. So we don't have a lot of time to get this right. And that's uh, really where fixed time AI comes into its own um, because we can get them pregnant earlier, start that cycling earlier on, um, and just have that sort of big jump up in our pregnancy rates early on in the season. And again, this graph shows that by getting them pregnant quicker, we're going to have more calves on the ground um, next season. So it all comes down to numbers. Why do we enroll whole herds in fixed time AI programs as opposed to watching for heats? Um, basically, the more calves earlier, um, the tighter calving drop. It's, it's the numbers game. We want to use fixed time AI to increase those numbers. So if we assume the pregnancy rate is 50%, which is the global average, um, if we're inseminating to uh, the only those that we're observing in heat, and maybe we're only observing half the herd in heat, then we're only inseminating those 50 cows, and the, you know, the pregnancy rate is still going to be 50%, no matter 
how many we're um, inseminating. So that's only 25 of those cows now that are, are going to be pregnant to your uh, frozen semen. So uh, the idea of doing a blanket AI, not heat, is that even though it's always going to be the same percentage regardless, we're submitting a lot more of those cows. So we're going to get better results. Um, an exception might be if you were using semen that was very rare, or very expensive. Um, but yeah, that's something to sort of think about in your program as well. And I think I'll pass back over to Megan to talk about seasonal calving. Thanks, Rachel. Um, yeah, so if your system um, goals are for moving to seasonal calving or changing your seasonal calving, some of the objectives for that tighter calving may include um, having that shorter calving window, so longer recovery for your cows to reduce the calving drift. Um, it also allows for a faster identification of passengers um, and so those ones with reproductive issues that you might be feeding and it gives you a more targeted herd management plan so you can preg test, you can identify those ones with issues um, and that also frees up um, a bit of cash flow as well if you're selling off those, those breeders you don't want in the herd um, to invest back into the herd again. It gives you a more controlled use of resources so you can target feed and supplement those animals um, in a more controlled fashion. You can use your pregnancy testing to um, fetal age those, those breeders and some of those ones towards the tail end that might be struggling a bit because we've tried to front load that, that system. Um, we can start supplementing those in a different way to help them along than the ones at the front end. So that's um, something to think about, as well as improving your time management. Um, if you're getting in contract labourers for anything, this really helps having controlled seasonal calving. Um, you may also be able to run less cows as a total, but they may be more productive animals in the long run because they're staying in the herd longer. They've um, got a better calving interval for you, so they're more productive. Um, and it can also be used as an emission management tool um, through different ways of spelling pastures and um, having that tighter system in place. Um, and as a summary too, fixed time AI early in the breeding season doesn't just help with that initial um, that AI program. There are some lasting benefits for the herd too. So some of these we've already touched on, but I wanted to split it up into heifers and cows a little bit further. Um, firstly, that tight conception pattern helps with the more even calf drop they have longer to recover. Um, and this is particularly helpful for those first calf heifers that are essentially still growing themselves at this time point and they're always the hardest group to, to rebreed. So giving them longer to recover gives them a better body condition um, coming into their second joining. That better body condition at calving and coming into that next joining also gives you a higher percentage of the herd cycling for that joining, so you get better pregnancy rates earlier in the season. Um, and a lot of reason for doing this in your heifers is it sets them up for a more productive lifespan in your herd. Um, when we look at preg testing and fetal aging, as I said, we can identify those less fertile heifers. You might be able to draft those off as feeders. Um, you can identify which ones you want to keep as retained heifers. And um, you can have a more uniform cull system as well. Reducing the risk of unwanted genetics is something to think about, particularly in extensive systems um, that we see a lot across the north. So if you are getting as many of those animals pregnant at the beginning of the season, as early as you can with heifers, and also as close to calving as you possibly can with cows, that is going to minimise the impacts of um, unwanted genetics coming in from, from wandering stock from neighbouring properties or reserves or anything like that, um, it's really handy for management uh, for those genetic systems too. Also with heifers, they are quite a good group to work with because um, they don't have a calf at foot and when you're using fixed time AI programs, you don't have to watch for heat, so it helps with the time, uh, time management as well. When you're using fixed time AI, um, for, for your heifer herd um, and for cows actually, you can utilise better genetics. So when you're retaining heifers, 
those heifers are going to be of a higher genetic merit than what they would possibly be if you're using natural mating. And when we move on to cows, some of these things, as I said, we've already gone over, but once again, the high mob is joined at the beginning of the season, we're front loading it, and several weeks, or as opposed to several weeks or months for a natural mated herd. Um, it, so the ability to treat non-cyclers um, through synchrony programs is quite beneficial. So if they're not cycling due to um, nutritional problems or any stress after calving, this is, is quite a handy tool that we can use to help kickstart them earlier. Um, it doesn't account for poor genetics though, so if they have actual fertility issues, it won't fix it, but it can help um, tighten that calving pattern up. The other thing to think about too is once they've been kick-started and put through an AI program, some of these animals, um, if they miss the AI or if we're kick-starting those non-cyclers and they miss the AI, their follow-up heats are quite fertile. So when you put the mop-up balls in, you still get a fairly tight um, joining pattern and with good success rates. And it also helps reduce that calving drift, bringing that system back down into that one calf per cow per year. And those fertile cows are going to stay in your herd longer so you can retain the genetics that you want for longer. Um, some of the take home messages that hopefully um, we found you've got out of today's presentation are learning how to know your herd um, and what your goals are and how to make them work together. How to choose your breeding systems and aligning that with your particular business objectives. And also, Understanding how assisted reproduction can be used as a herd building um, management tool and can complement some of those breeding objectives that you've got. So in summary today we've um, covered those breeding objectives, how to set them, how to identify your re, uh, herd rebuilding goals. We've also had a look at the types of assisted reproduction that are available and how to match those with your breeding objectives. If you want to join us again next week for part two of this series, um, we'll be covering the uh, preparation of the herd for joining, so their backgrounding, uh, breeder and bull physiology, how to set expectations for your breeding, breeding season, how to run assisted reproductive programs and things to consider, um, as well as measuring your success rates from that. So you can log on to that, um, that webinar via our Facebook page, the Cattle Plan Facebook page, or via um, the Future Beef events calendar on their website and it will take you to the registration page. And I think that's everything we have for you today. If you have any follow-up questions um, or if you'd like some more information about the, uh, the information we've presented today or the Cattle Plan range and the services that Minitube Australia can provide, our contact details are listed there and you can get in contact with us um, or your local cattle plant distributor to, um, to have a chat to us about um, helping you with your reproductive goals for this season. So we thank everybody for taking the time out of the day to join us for this webinar and we hope to see you all again next week. Thank you very much.